The Honorable Mayor Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados, your excellencies, dear friends, a very good morning to you all and the warmest of welcomes to the International Peace Institute for the inaugural uh, Kofi Annan Lecture. Uh, we welcome to our online audience. Uh, I am Zaid Raid Al Hussein, President of IPI, and we are delighted to have with us today the Chair of the IPI Board, the Honorable Kevin Rudd AC, who will also be addressing us this morning. This lecture was created with the full support of Nan Anan, whom we are thrilled to say is with us here and will be speaking to you next. The lecture has been the joint endeavor uh, between uh, the International Peace Institute, the Open Society Foundations, the International Crisis Group, and the Kofi Annan Foundation. We are privileged uh, to be joined by OSF's president, Lord Malik Brown, who was uh, Kofi's chef de cabinet and then deputy secretary general, and who will be introducing our distinguished inaugural speaker shortly. We are also joined by President Comfort uh, Aero of ICG, uh, who will address us soon, and by President Corinne Momal Banyan of the Kofi Annan Foundation, who has provided us with inspired leadership in furthering uh, Kofi's legacy. Your Excellency Prime Minister Motley, uh, as you can see this morning, you are in the warm embrace of Team Kofi. <laughs> Assembled around you are his family, his close friends, and many former senior mid-ranking and junior UN staff members. To us, Kofi Annan was the epitome of human decency, a graceful and charismatic leader who cared deeply about the fate of everyone, never differentiating when mixing with or addressing people from different stations in life or from different countries. He loved people and spoke for those who needed him and the UN on many occasions with great courage. In a world today poisoned by so much thuggery and greed, unrestrained and vulgar, his style of elegant yet accessible leadership now seems almost from a bygone age. And whatever else we may have accomplished throughout our own lives, we take the deepest pride in the knowledge that for a critical part of it, we served with Kofi and experienced his example, his unmistakable wisdom, his kindness, and with that lovely, sometimes mischievous grin of his and the laugh he made us believe, oh, okay, we'll be fine. We have Kofi Annan. And every little thing gonna be all right. <laughs> Prime Minister, what have you done to us? <laughs> this lecture in Kofi's name honors the one leader we believe Kofi would have admired someone whom we believe is best fulfilling Kofi's legacy and is standing up for the values he so cherished. It now gives me enormous pleasure to invite Nan Anan, beloved by us all, to the podium. Dear friends, it's so very moving for me to be here today, so close to the United Nations, the home of Kofi, and to which he dedicated his life. And I want to thank all the organizers, Said, Mark, uh, Susanna Malkor and Comfort, and Corinne also from the Kofi Anna Foundation for making this happen, this brilliant idea. It's such a wonderful idea to have this lecture and wonderful that you will be here to start it. Not only does it honor Kofi's legacy, but true to his style, it is forward-looking in providing an opportunity for leaders to set out new ideas and, for and agendas for international cooperation and diplomacy. I see many old friends here, but also new faces, and which assures me that his voice still resonates 
far and wide. He cared deeply about the UN and within in the framework of its mission for we the peoples. On his appointment, he set about a reform program which would enhance its reach. I may remind you of the Millennium Development Goals, which in clear, simple language drew up a roadmap for sustainable development. His response to the AIDS pandemic was also typical. He reached out to new sectors to make sure that there would be affordable medicine and was instrumental in the establishment of the Global Fund for AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria. And during his time, institutions like the International Criminal Court and the Human Rights Council were established that carried the promise of justice on a global scale. The, new, the need for new ideas and dialogue are as crucial as ever as terrible conflicts rage and civilian governments are toppled in regions which we thought had forsaken military coups. Democracy is challenged by autocratic leaders and the framework of digital networks. And Kofi was prescient in setting up the Commission on Democracy in the Digital Age. And his foundation is pursuing his work in defense of democracy as a cornerstone of good governance. And of course, we are all keenly aware of the disabling effects of climate change as floods, drought, and the scarcity of water spread across the world, threatening the very existence of lives and livelihoods. We need a new generation of leaders to show the same courage, wisdom, compassion, and skills as Kofi demonstrated during his time at the UN and later as the head of his foundation. We need men and women of vision who will find the key to unlock our multilateral systems and who will build effective responses to the enormous challenges that await us and our children. He often said, the world is not ours to keep. We hold it in trust for future generations. Prime Minister, you are one of these leaders. You speak truth to the big powers and you are an eloquent and effective advocate for social justice and for a more responsible stewardship of our planet. We could think of no one better than you to start this inaugural lecture series. And I want to thank you sincerely for being with us here today. And finally, let me thank Kevin Rudd and Sid and the International Peace Institute for hosting us here and the work that has gone into making this possible. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. It's so uh, sorry. <laughs> it's very moving. Man, thank you. And um, there's never a dry eye in the room when we talk about Kofi. For, for so many of us, he was the inspiration of our lives in terms of our work. And Kevin may, may remember it. We sat on a porch this summer and were talking about our lives in politics and international affairs and self-critiquing ourselves as being a little transactional, that we would quickly jump into work discussions with colleagues when we hadn't seen them before. And then contrasting it to Kofi, who was the ultimate relationship person who always started by asking after the children, uh, after the wife, the family, uh, the job, before getting to the issue. And it was both the depth of his humanity, but also his skill as a diplomat. He wanted to understand you first, and it was a remarkable thing to watch this decent man making the world a little bit more decent too. And when we thought of establishing this lecture series, it was, couldn't we find leaders who would once a year define the world's agenda for us at the beginning or in the early days of a general assembly in the hope that it would shape the discussions to come. It would lift one presentation above the rest and be the place where we sought to define uh, what the world should be thinking about in the coming months. And you can imagine it was quite a challenge to think who should be the first giver of this lecture. And actually, we very quickly arrived at a consensus. There is an extraordinary leader in the Caribbean. Any of you who live in New York and saw the New York Times 
magazine story on her extraordinarily forceful and formidable leadership to redesign as the leader of a small country, what the IMF and others would provide in terms of a debt deal to provide essentially a break in debt repayments when natural disaster struck. You know, this was not sorted out in some policy debate uh, in, in a UN conference room or in Washington. It was settled toe to toe uh, with vulture funds uh, and hot shot, hot, gun shooting lawyers on both sides, but it was a famous victory. And it's a famous victory by someone who has been prime minister of our country since 2018, has served as, as finance minister in many other roles as well there, but is emerging as any of you who've been around this week will have seen, whether it was at the goalkeepers uh, the, or, or elsewhere, Mia Motley is a huge coming voice on the international stage. She was a uh, chair of, and then co-chair of the World Bank's Development Committee, a very uncomfortable one for that institution, if I'm allowed to say so, uh, by pressing for much more radical steps than its current leadership, I suspect, is comfortable with. But she is a challenger. She's an insurgent. She's exactly the kind of person who not only should be defining the agenda coming forward, but I suspect, and Kofi would be delighted by this, this lecture will for many mark perhaps the first time you've seen her in action. But I think I can confidently say as someone who 40 years ago attached myself to Kofi, as somebody who I thought would go the whole way, to someone else who I think will go a very long way and maybe the whole way, Mia. Thank you very much, Mark. <clears throat> and may I say, may I call you Nan, please? Uh, <laughs> the truth is that um, even before I start, the emotion is very heavy. And the emotion is heavy because I'm still a little girl that watched Kofi Annan and Nelson Mandela and Fidel Castro and Bill Clinton and all of these people who define the world in which I grew up as much as I was inspired by Bob and Jimmy and Sparrow and others. So that this is a special moment because it allows us to truly pay tribute to a man ahead of his times. And as I said, this is truly a privilege to have been asked by this group of organizations to give this inaugural lecture in honor of this man ahead of his times, Kofi Annan. For many states, the multilateral system that Kofi championed for his professional life is of the highest importance. He knew that big places are made up of small places. And when he visited my own country, Barbados, in 2002, it was special for us. For he came to inaugurate a new United Nations house. And he expressed this with his usual sensitivity and candor. And I quote, small countries appreciate that collective interests and collective action is also the national interest. What happens in your nations is of great concern to the rest of the world. Your countries are places where in concentrated form, many of the main problems of development and environment are unfolding. Your experiences, your experiments, your transformation can guide the way to a brighter future for all peoples. Those were his words. I therefore speak to you today in a mode of reflection and as a daughter of the African diaspora and the leader of one of those countries of which he spoke in that quotation. I speak to you about the life and legacy of one of Africa's finest sons, one who led the world truly and made that real difference. Kofi Atta Annan, Nobel laureate, orator, visionary, mediator, intellectual, optimist, and above all, a gentleman. I speak to you about how that legacy 
resonates so strongly today as the world is confronted with perils and challenges unknown for generations, but against which Kofi warned us time and time again. Today, a proud daughter, as I said, of Africa will speak to the legacy and vision of an African son, a legacy of which we can all be proud and a vision with which I and many others closely identify. Make no mistake, Kofi Annan's perspective and work were shaped by the fact that he was African, that he understood the enduring impacts of colonization on the environment, on society, on the economy, and on psyche, our psyche. His approach as Secretary General, I believe, was influenced by the fact that across his continent, the struggle for peace, to end poverty, to desire to have a desire for genuine independence and true self-governments still endured against a history of colonial occupation, citizen oppression, rampant resource exploitation, and regrettably, as I've said over and over, an imperialistic post-World War II order still very much in place. In these remarks, I would like to look at him as an African son, as a global citizen, and assess his contribution, his legacy, and his vision as Secretary General of the United Nations. I believe we have an obligation so to root him today. It was my honor and pleasure to meet him on that occasion when he visited Barbados exactly 20 years ago. I was then a young minister carrying the portfolio of Attorney General, having come out of Minister of Education, Youth and Culture. My hair tells me that time has flown, <laughs> but my body and mind tell me that it was yesterday. Speaking at the opening, he paid tribute to our country's aspirations, capacities, and our achievements. And he made a statement that every Barbadian will tell you continues to be quoted by all, that Barbados punches far above its weight in the global community. It brought pride to our people when he delivered those remarks. It was a generous compliment. And believe you me, we continue to embrace it with enthusiasm and pride. And perhaps that is our continued inspiration coming from a rock of 166 square miles. We accept this kind of responsibility that comes with it. Understanding only too well the battles that have been fought have been hard won, and that we must continue to fight new battles as we are all understanding today. Shortly after Barbados successfully hosted the first United Nations Conference on Small Island Developing States in 1994, marking the first time that the United Nations held a global conference in one of the world's smallest states, we knew that that was part of his legacy or part of what he was saying, sorry, to describe us. Similarly, I speak to you today as president of UNCTAD, having been the smallest nation again to lead that conference in Barbados last year in October of 2021. I didn't know him well, and it is perhaps a great regret as I said to Nan this morning, but I feel deeply the connection of his work to our work today that we have been entrusted to do. So forgive me, please, just as I've asked your permission to formally refer to him in this lecture as Kofi. It is a sign of affection, respect, inspiration, and indeed connection. When I use the words respect, inspiration, connection, I'm really referring to his ideas and his actions on the global stage but also as has been said this morning to who he was as a man. His country of birth, Ghana, equally has a special place in our hearts and indeed the genes of Barbadians. Barbados was an Akan speaking nation before the end of the 17th century. Many of our ancestors came from that region. And yes, through a crime against humanity, but on that gross and tragic history, 
we truly have forged new bonds. In 2019, the president of Ghana visited Barbados and became the first head of state other than Queen Elizabeth II to address a joint sitting of the Barbados parliament. And I equally had the honor to speak before the Ghanaian parliament. And in March of this year, I had the distinct honor to speak at the 65th anniversary of the independence celebrations of the people and government of Ghana. So that the connections are more emotional, as I said. We opened our first diplomatic mission in Africa, in Accra last year. And just a few weeks ago, literally, we co-hosted with the African Export Import Bank, the first ever Africa-Caribbean Trade and Investment Forum under the theme of one people, one destiny, uniting and reimagining our future. And simply put, to be able to remove the middleman, the middle leg, and finally, the scars of the Middle Passage. This is a small measure of the broader picture and relations that bind our region in the Caribbean to the great continent of Africa together. And today, we are offering the connections for all, both from the heart, but also the head. And I say so conscious that there are three United Nations headquarters. And for the majority of the independence of Caribbean nations' lives, we've had representatives in two of the three, but not in the third in Africa. We chose to correct that last year as well by opening our mission in Nairobi, Kenya, ensuring that we remove those bridges that, in the words of Marcus Messiah Garvey, need to be removed as we emancipate ourselves from mental slavery. As Secretary General, Kofi Annan's achievements are, not were, are stellar. I'll mention a few before I want to look into a few aspects of his thought this morning. The International Criminal Court came into being during Kofi's first term as Secretary General in 1998. For us, it is even more special, for it was the idea of the Prime Minister, then of Trinidad and Tobago, A.N.R. Robinson. It is a court with significant Caribbean connection, as I said, and Kofi Annan brought his powers of persuasion to bear on the subject, and by so doing, was able to achieve the establishment of the court, which had been opposed by influential countries. Indeed, if I may, when the United States government, and this is for perspective, decided that they wanted to have a waiver from prosecution, immunity from prosecution with Article 98, they threatened that they would remove all military support from those countries that would not support them. The Caribbean countries remained resolute and indicated, and I was then deputy prime minister, so I remember it clearly, that we would hate that you should do such a thing. But if that is your will, let it be done. And it was after that, for the first time, that China offered military aid to the Caribbean. Kofi Annan's work in strong collaboration, Mark, with you on the Millennium Development Goals in 2000 were truly inspirational and groundbreaking. It created a common development agenda for the entire multilateral system in the world. And the MDGs today, of course, have led to the SDGs and Agenda 2030. And I stand to you as a chair, a co-chair of the advocates group of the SDGs and proudly so, for I have said, the Millennium Development Goals and the SDGs are simply our development work to make the world better and to allow people to sleep easier each and every night. And there can be no more noble mission. Even as we set these mission together, we struggle as an international community today to attain these goals. No one, in spite of the difficulty of us finding financing for them. No one can dispute the value, the impact, and the universality of these goals. They remain as undiminished today as when you and Kofi settled them so many years ago. He launched the Global Compact in 2000, 
the objective being to encourage greater corporate social responsibility. And we have seen that at both the national and international levels, and to advocate for greater collaboration between the private sector and the United Nations. And we have equally seen that continue. Under Kofi Annan's watch, we saw the establishment in 2002 of the groundbreaking Global Fund to fight tuberculosis, AIDS, and malaria. And you will forgive me if I pause here yet again, for one of the chairmen of that body was a person who I call my big sister, Dr. Carol Jacobs, who led it with distinction. And her assistant is in fact now my permanent secretary, Alice Jordan, if I'll ask her to stand so that she too can be recognized as part of that journey. I today benefit from the experience which she earned by being part of that journey with respect to the management and leadership of the Global Fund. And of course, Kofi was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2001, along with the United Nations. The Nobel Committee's citation paints the critical arch under which he worked. And I quote, while clearly underlining the UN's traditional responsibility for peace and security, he has also emphasized its obligations with regard to human rights. He has risen to such new challenges as HIV and AIDS and international terrorism and brought about more efficient utilization of the UN's modest resources. In an organization that can hardly become more than its members permit, he has made clear that sovereignty cannot be a shield behind which member states conceal their violations, end quote. <clears throat> I want today to draw on two primary sources of Kofi's thinking. On December 11, 2006, he gave his final speech as UN Secretary General. He chose the Truman Presidential Museum and Library in Harry Truman's home state of Missouri as a homage to an American president whom he described as the master builder and the faithful champion of the organization in its early years, unquote. In the cold Missouri winter, not so far from where he started his journey as a young student on scholarship in Minnesota half a century earlier, he shared what he described as the five lessons from him in his time in office. And I share them with you now. The first lesson was about the value and importance of collective responsibility. We don't live alone and we cannot survive alone. In the collectives are equity, protection and strength. The challenges we face are global and they demand a global response. They demand global leadership, strategic moral leadership. Yet as members of the human family and leaders of the countries of the world, we are confronted with the greatest threats to development and human well-being. We are confronted with a clear and present danger of the existential threat posed by the climate crisis to all in the future, but today to all living between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn. If I was given this speech, in the spring of this year, I might have had to work a little harder to persuade those who are deniers. But the last summer says it all. And as we would say as lawyers, raise ipsa loquitur. The facts speak for themselves. We are confronted, therefore, with the unstoppable and destructive power, equally, I should say, of that of a pandemic on top of a climate crisis. And the looming danger, not just of the pandemic of which you are aware, COVID-19, but the one that I work with the World Health Organization as chair, co-chair with the Prime Minister of Bangladesh in the One Health Global Initiative to try and bring attention to, the slow motion silent pandemic of antimicrobial resistance, making the possibility that we can reverse a century of medical progress a reality if we don't confront it. Today, we're equally 
facing the fragility of global supply chains. And only before coming into this room, I shared with you our own experience in Barbados as a result of Hurricane Fiona threatening access to natural gas to those of us in the region, because that is the source from which we purchase our natural gas in addition to what we use and develop from our off onshore resources. But have we really understood Kofi's lesson that without collective responsibility, our chances of defeating these monsters are truly jeopardized? A spring and summer from the USA to China, as I just said. I mean, just look at it, look at it. Floods and wildfires. I can't imagine what it is like to live in California and to have the risk that everything you own, most importantly, from the pictures of your grandmother and your grandfather to the mementos given, loss because of fire. Freak storms has happened in my own country last year when in 90 minutes we had 46,000 lightning strikes. It was like having a strobe light remain constant. And if I didn't experience it, I would challenge a person and say that it was an act of fiction to which they were referring. Heat so scorching that the airport at Heathrow had to be closed when the runway started to melt. And of course now, <clears throat> the apocalyptic floods of Pakistan affecting 33 million people and leaving 1,500 people dead. How many more, in the words of one of my own friends and cabinet, former cabinet members, John King, in his wonderful song, how many more must suffer? How many more? How many more economies must be pushed to the brink? I ask us to think of these things. The second matter, of course, and the lesson that he gave us on that speech was the necessity for global solidarity. If ever there was a time, if ever, if ever there was a time for global solidarity, that time was presented to us in the last two and a half years with the COVID-19 pandemic. The virus spread all over, all over the world, touching every shore, killing millions and causing untold harm to millions more, disrupting our lives and everything we came to cherish about it. I remind you that Kofi had cautioned us in an almost prescient foretelling. And forgive me once again for quoting him, because you must understand why I say he was a man ahead of his time. And I quote, all of us are vulnerable to what we think of as dangers that threaten only other people. But millions of Americans could quickly become <clears throat> infected if a new disease were to break out in a country with poor health care and be carried across the world by unwitting air travelers before it was identified. Has it sunk in? <laughs> While the COVAX facility was supposed <clears throat> to ensure vaccine doses to the larger populations of developing countries through vaccine nationalism and outright shameless hoarding. By November 2021, some 576 million doses had gone to developing countries, while developed countries held how many? 7.5 billion doses. Where's the justice in that? Where is it? Where is the global solidarity? To the end, Kofi Annan believed in his third lesson. And what is that? Something that we cherish greatly in my own nation, the rule of law, the platform for both undergirding and delivering peace and development. For without the rule of law, there is no platform for either. He was a mediator on difficult global issues and believed in respect for sovereignty and the rule of law at the national and domestic levels as a precursor, as I said, 
for peace and prosperity. It is ironic that yesterday, the theme of my speech to the General Assembly was peace, love, and prosperity. And I therefore spoke in the shadow of Kofi Annan yesterday as I called for that in the global community. He would have been, <clears throat> he would truly have been in his element today. As we consider history and look around the world, it is true to say that the UN has lived up to its mandate of preventing the scourge of another world war. But we have not eliminated small wars, thank you, saber rattling or sectarian violence. A survey of the global security situation, notably in Eastern Europe and in the Middle East, but in many other places as well, like in Africa, it reminds us daily of the tragic inability of the international system to deliver more peace and more security to the many vulnerable people of the world. We simply must work harder. For I ask, when will we as a global community prefer the silence or music of peace over the dissonant songs and prophets of war? And regrettably, I fear that those who favor profiteering are winning the battle over those of us who want the silence of peace. And then, of course, there was mutual accountability, which was Kofi's fourth lesson. For me, this raises the question, as we would say in that famous Calypso in the Caribbean, who can guard the guard? Who will guard the guards? The European Union and the OECD have developed black and gray lists of other countries that they deem non-compliant with rules which govern anti-money laundering measures and counter-terrorism financing measures. They frame the rules. They act as judge and jury. They treat their countries preferentially as they pronounce verdicts, often without the application of the rules of natural justice, which gave an accused a right to be heard and to prove their innocence. And countries for years like ours have been put on blacklists. I want to salute for the first time, however, the leadership of President von der Leyen and Franz Timmermans, who I think are beginning to appreciate the message that we are bringing. But the complexity of the architecture that makes these lists still remains the obstacle. For they will tell you, as I shall share with you, that while the commission may have a perspective, fundamentally it is the actions of member states acting in their own political sovereignty that constitute ECOFIN. But can we continue to carry the burden of architectures that are inconvenient truths and behind which many will hide. I say no. It's not our banks that precipitated the global financial scandal and crisis 15 years ago. It's not through our banks that the majority of the corrupt proceeds pass. The countries which bear the responsibility for the real problems in global financial services appear to be exempt from the rules and the scrutiny to which developing countries are subjected. And let me yet again go back to Kofi's words. Accountability of states to their citizens, of states to one another, of international institutions to their members, and of this present generation to future ones is essential for our success. I ask you, who then is going after the real centers of money laundering and the safe havens for corrupt capital? What does mutual accountability look like? And how do we put it in place? And I say simply, where have they found the money from the Russian oligarchs. It hasn't been on the sunny shores of the Caribbean. <laughs> <laughs> Yet again, raise ipsa loquitur. The facts speak 
for themselves. The necessity and value of multilateralism was his fifth lesson. And Kofi shared that as he spoke in Missouri, and I quote yet again, it is only through multilateral institutions that states can hold each other to account. And that makes it very important to organize these institutions in a fair and democratic way, giving the poor and the weak some influence over the actions of the rich and the strong. My friends, when put this way, questions follow naturally. Questions of effectiveness, questions of what is now commonly called fitness for purpose of international organizations, questions about the future of multilateralism in a world with an extreme tendency to populism, a rising tide of nationalism, religious sectarianism, and a world that has changed since the institutions of the past, which were supposed to save the world and its people, was established. Does multilateralism as we know it today effectively address our common problems of security, inequity and inequality, exclusion, the climate crisis, socioeconomic deprivation? Do they exist to find solutions for our common future and deliver the world as we want? Does it give credence or impetus to our common agenda, as our current Secretary General urges us, and I, I feel for him, and his courageous leadership, I feel for him, for he continues to be that voice, imploring us to take on the common agenda. Does multilateralism today, as it is being practiced, enlarge our freedoms, freedom from want, freedom from fear, freedom to live in dignity. It is my view that we cannot and will not deliver on the large or small freedoms, on the absence of want, fear, or indeed to create a pervasive culture of dignity until we deal with the fundamental issue of citizen inclusion and active citizenship. My own charter in Barbados, as we became a republic last year, speaks specifically to the role of active citizenship. I do not intend to detain you today with a treatise on it, but suffice it to say that the other person who inspired me in my work, the late, great Nelson Mandela, I have the honor to do a lecture in his name in November, and it is to that that I will be speaking on that occasion. One of the greatest challenges facing leaders today is the deficit of trust. Distrust creates distance between citizens on the one hand and leaders and institutions on the other. Those institutions could be national, they could be regional, they could be global. Distrust forever fosters the same consequences. Where there is distrust, there is also alienation and exclusion. We know it, we've lived it, we've seen it. And trust has currency, on the other hand. It has value. It is a fulcrum for social stability. Trust, we know, is built when citizens become invested in their own society, the one in which they live. <clears throat> and that investment comes from citizens feeling a sense of social and economic inclusion feeling that they have something on the line, something to gain and something to lose, believing that they are valued, that they're seen, that they're heard, and that they're felt, simply put, as I keep saying, and that ultimately they have a future. Trust comes when citizens believe and can attest to the existence, yes, of global, moral, strategic leadership which acts as an ethical compass to economic equity and social equality for its citizens. Trust, my friends, and inclusion are indivisible. And it doesn't occur by accident. 
It's not a random byproduct of chaotic governance or poor governance structures or weak and failing institutions or leadership that is alienated from the populace. <clears throat> Deep and increasing distrust results when citizens believe that their governments, national and global institutions are disconnected from them, do not represent their views and are not concerned about including them. They don't see them, they don't feel them, they don't hear them. Inclusion, on the other hand, involves giving individuals agency, the power of agency, the dignity of agency, a say in their own affairs, and a stake above all else in their own society and economy in which they live. And you know, when citizens in the developed world believe that they have no obligation to help developing nations, it is because they do not know and may not wish to know that it was the slave trade and it was the gun that built empires and empires that financed industrialization and that the face of colonization allowed their countries to thrive and to become wealthy. That my country and others like mine are pushed to the brink of disaster as a result of it. And the very same countries which have pushed us there while growing their economies will take the money made at the expense of our blood, our sweat and our tears and lend it to us at commercial rates or insurance premium to fix the climate crisis that they have caused by extracting the money from us to fuel the industrial revolution, which fuels now the climate crisis. I call it double jeopardy. It is wrong, it is unfair, it is unjust, and fundamentally, it supports everything that we are being told for the last two decades that should not happen. They tell us that the polluter shall pay, but in truth, it is their profits that benefit instead of paying. We cannot abide this injustice any longer. And when we make the case for reparations, it is not a case that is being made with emotion or acrimony, but it is simply to right size the wrongs so that we can go together in harmony as one to fight the great battles of our time. But as Earl Lovelace, that great Trinidadian author said in the book that for me is the work of his life that took him more than 10 years to write and that won the Commonwealth Book Prize, the book calls Salt, without the conversation and without the resolution, there can be no progress because forever there shall be a burning unsettled agenda in the chest of so many that therefore dissipates the energy that we need to come together to fight the greatest battles of humanity. My friends, trust is also not created when countries pledge, as I said yesterday, $100 billion per annum for climate finance and then deliver a fraction to developing countries. Or when the same countries commit to 0.7% of GDP as of ODA, development assistance, but we don't see it nor get it. Or when the countries that stop others from exploiting new found fossil fuels are historically the world's largest producers and polluters. And I just gave you the story of our experience with the clean energy bridge of natural gas that the International Energy Agency says must still be part of the equation in 2050 because you will still need 20% fossil fuels. And as I said yesterday and over and over this week, there is a disconnect between commitments and capacity. And unless we have the granular planning and organization, we may find ourselves romanticizing, as we should all love to do, but not being able to make the brand real because we can't deliver on it. 
My country this year committed to a tax holiday for electric vehicles, two-year tax holiday. One problem, the supply is so limited that only a few can benefit from it. My country this year, we determined that we could not leave the sun, the wind, and the ocean to be privatized for the benefit of a few. And that therefore every Barbadian household where the person owns the house shall have as of right, the right to have renewable energy on their roofs so that they too can benefit from the bounty that this green revolution, not only, um, that this green revolution effectively provides such that not only large local capital or foreign capital should benefit from it. My friends, we do that, but then we hear that there's a difficulty in accessing the batteries that are necessary to make it a reality. And that lithium is in short supply. So that unless we match capacity and commitment, we will end up with people not falling through the safety net, but falling through chasms that we have left open. Trust equally does not follow when the world's citizens can see, and once again, I use Kofi's language, that the global partnership for development is more than a phrase, than, is, no, is no more phrase than fact. We can't be paying lip service to it and expect people to trust us. This year's global political climate has been as hot, truly, as the world's temperatures. And as leaders, we must ensure that people have real access to the fundamentals of development, that lives of dignity can be theirs. That's, that's, that's how you build trust. That's how it's built. And where leaders and institutions must not, as Kofi put it, leave our citizens, and I quote, to rot on the margins of the world economy. To rot on the margins of the world economy. So trust and inclusion, how do we build them? What we need, my friends, is a new internationalism, a truly inclusive United Nations and international system. The United Nations was forged with the intention that it should be, and I quote, the indispensable common house of the entire human family. The indispensable common house of not half, not a quarter, not three quarters of the entire human family. And for a while, it was it, it, getting there. But we have to ask ourselves in the last 77 years, haven't we recognized that the world has changed? And if the organization is to serve today's member states, if it is to not run the risk of becoming irrelevant, it has to be more inclusive. The United Nations, particularly the Security Council, must be reflective of the current geopolitical realities and indeed of the birth of new nations. There cannot continue to be a situation where the Security Council in an organization of 195 member states has five permanent members which have a right of veto and can use it to frustrate the will of the majority as we saw in this year of our Lord. It cannot be an institution that purports to serve a modern world and which is prepared to deliver on a future for the next generation when it carries, that it carries and when it is constrained by what? Simply the cloak of history, simply an imperialistic order that threatens to survive against the will of the majority of the people of this earth. My friends, I want to turn now to a second impact, an important expression of Kofi's thought and legacy, which is intimately connected. 
to one of the greatest challenges countries like mine are facing today. A dozen years ago, in 2009, in the wake of the global financial crisis, Kofi Annan spoke passionately about the disproportionate impact of the crisis on developing countries a dozen years ago. States which had done little or nothing to cause that financial crisis, but who once again were on the front line and bearing the biggest damage. There were casualties. My country has not recovered from it. And that is a battle that I have been fighting during the stewardship of my time as prime minister. The parallels to the climate crisis are, of course, startling. Kofi Annan then recommended a slew of actions. And I want you to listen carefully to what he proposed. But well, we're not doing anything new. Immediate assistance. When somebody's bleeding, if you don't stop the bleeding, you could as well call the undertaker. Immediate assistance. Two, concessional lending and temporary financial support. Three, action to help countries tackle and adapt to the emerging climate crisis as it was then. Four, investment to strengthen, listen carefully, food systems. Five, a level playing field in global trade. Six, international financial institutions that reflect the makeup of the world and give opportunities to emerging economies and to least developed countries. He was candid, noting that the role of the international financial institutions has often been resented, that policy conditionality and fiscal prescriptions have been controversial, not least as their impact on growth and human development had been disputed. Today, the United Nations estimates that some 1.2 billion people in 94 countries are now at risk of food, energy, and financial stability. Over 71 million people have already been pushed into extreme poverty with hotspots in the Balkans, the Caspian Sea, and the Sahel regions. Rich countries have bailed out the banks. They've subsidized fossil fuel companies. They've stood by as food, as energy, and as pharmaceutical companies have seen their profits soar to egregious levels. And they have blocked progress on funding to help developing countries address the loss and damage that they have already suffered due to climate crisis. And may I say, with the exception of Denmark, who created precedent this week by committing $13 million to loss and damage, so that this is now a live and very present issue that cannot be allowed to die. The countries, as I said earlier, failed to mobilize the $100 billion in SDR reallocation that we all asked for. They have blocked proposals that would have made the IMF and the World Bank more representative of the world in which we live. And may I say there equally that they have failed to take the decisions to include Africa the African Union as a fundamental core member of the G7, which would then become G8 again, or G20, which should in fact go even beyond Africa, but that is another lecture. <laughs> By the end of 2020, the global response to the COVID-19 pandemic was estimated to be around $20 trillion. 90% of that was spent by a small number, a handful of rich countries. Just 0.04% of that was pledged to SIDS, small island developing states, LDCs, and LLDCs. Countries most 
in need by actual proof. And now, my friends, regrettably, we continue to be on track to make the same mistakes yet again. To some, this may sound like the appeal of a global South leader for funding in times of crisis. I can assure you it is not. This is about getting the world on track. This is about learning from our mistakes. This is about finding just solutions to current threats and longstanding inequalities that the world can no longer bear, that people can no longer abide. It is fundamentally about our interconnected fates and the reality check that developed economies cannot ex escape the spread of the climate crisis or indeed the financial wars or debt crisis if we do not cater for all. You know, as children, we learn the three musketeers, all for one and one for all. Is that only a fable? for children to enjoy a level of romanticism only to be immediately disappointed as they become adults? If a call to solidarity and justice, or what I like to say in simple language, Mark, togetherness and fairness, because sometimes this language gets too highfalutin. So let's break it down. Fairness that every child knows, and togetherness, because nobody small can't achieve anything without cooperation from somebody else. Togetherness. If fairness and togetherness will not spark the response we need to the converging crises stalking the world, we will end up with a response that's purely based on self-interest. And the world will look like the wild, wild, wild west as it did so many times during COVID and continues to do even today, as I said, with access to scarce resources with the global supply chain being disrupted. Earlier this year, we started an exercise, yes, of talking and discussing with civil society, with academics, with some countries, drawing on our experience and theirs, and putting together a small list of policy priorities, strategic and focused, that have in our view, the rarity of being both achievable and meaningful. We call it the Bridgetown Agenda because we ask people to come and join us there and to reflect on these things so that we can see how we can make the world a better place. Not because Barbados has that power. We don't, we're 166 square miles, but it is because we have that conscience and we feel the need to speak, even if others will call it a cry of conscience. And even if others will ask, who are they? We are simply ordinary people trying to make the world a better place and trying to appeal to those who actually have the power so to do. Today, we remind them and we remind ourselves that it is unprecedented because we have a trifecta of connected crises. The cost of living crisis stemming, of course, partly from the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the pandemic together coming as they did overlapping. A developing country debt crisis following the pandemic and climate related disasters that we're seeing. And may I remind you that tourism and travel dependent economies such as mine came out of the first year of the pandemic with double digit economic declines because the tourists simply could not come because of the shutdown. And finally, the climate crisis as the glaciers melt and the storms and the droughts intensify. And we call the storms and hurricanes the heart attacks of the climate crisis. And we call the droughts and the sargassum weed, the chronic NCDs of the climate crisis, and both are fatal. This situation is compounded by tightening monetary policies in developing countries, developed countries, sorry, mm -hmm. and a strengthening of the US dollar. One in five countries today is experiencing fiscal and financial stress.
one in five countries. Unaddressed, there will be deepening hardship. And we've already heard Kristalina talk about the difficult year that we are likely to face next year, more so than this year. The deepening hardship is there. The debt defaults are imminent. The widening inequality continues unabated. And the political upheaval comes as a consequence of that widening inequality. And of course, there is the threat of the delayed shift to low carbon. Global leaders are, I would like to believe, now experienced in managing crises. The last few years have made them that. They know what to do. And they have the means necessary. We must act now, not next year or the year after, or when the next set of leaders come. We cannot be good at rescuing banks, but not good at saving countries. We cannot be good at rescuing banks, but not good at saving countries. And I speak now on behalf of all the countries that are at risk, not just on behalf of my own, not because they have asked me to do so, but because it is the right and moral thing to do. The first step, therefore, we suggest immediately, is to provide liquidity to stop the debt crisis in its track. I said earlier, if you're bleeding, each of us knows the first thing to do is stop the bleeding. And just because you did it early in the pandemic does not mean that you don't do it again, because the reality is that we don't face a mono crisis. I just spoke about the trifecta and take care it becomes a superfecta. We therefore call upon the board, the board more so than the management, the political directorates who constitute the board of the International Monetary Fund at the annual meetings in two weeks time in October to do one, return access to its unconditional rapid credit and financing facilities to the previous crisis levels. I just told you that we are not facing a mono crisis. Two, temporarily suspend its interest surcharges for heavy borrowers because interest rates have already risen and there can be no justifiable reason for the maintenance of those temporary surcharges. Three, rechannel at least, at least, $100 billion of unused special drawing rights to those who need it. And also remember that almost on each occasion we leave unused SDRs on the table. Four, and I want to salute Kristalina for her courage in establishing the Resilience and Sustainability Trust because it is the only long-term money to middle-income climate vulnerable countries that still have poor people. So don't ever forget that 70% of the world's poor actually live in middle-income countries, not low-income countries. And that RST, therefore, is designed to provide concessionary funds for climate-vulnerable countries to strengthen their climate resilience. We ask the IMF to operationalize that as a matter of urgency, as I know they're trying to do. And at the same time that we ask these things, the G20, country, the G20 countries should agree on a far more ambitious debt service suspension initiative that includes all multilateral development bank loans to the poorest countries and to some middle income countries who are affected as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm not an economist, but from day one I said, we need long-term capital to fight this crisis. And I don't want to delay you any further, but I remind you simply of what the United Kingdom was allowed to do for themselves in turning bonds of 1914 and 1917 in 1932 into perpetual bonds at a 5% interest rate instead of 3.5%, but allowed to pay it off when, Mark, in 2014, or when 
the developed world that won the war allowed Germany to be able to have its debt service capped at 5% of its exports revenue. Isn't this triple crisis not the equivalent of a World War I and World War II to the developing world? But my friends, liquidity alone is not enough. And these crises have systemic roots. And that is why we must address not just the outer symptoms, but the systemic roots. And therefore, only investment will change their course. So while addressing these immediate needs, we must also lay the path towards a new financial system that drives financial resources towards climate-related and sustainable development goals. The IMF must now have at its core not simply financial systemic crises, but integrate climate crises and other exogenous shocks as critical matters to which they must address their attention. These goals require the rapid scaling up of investment in low carbon transition in the energy, transport, and agricultural sectors to safeguard, I'm almost frightened to say, it, a 1.5 degrees Celsius target, providing for substantial investment in building, in building climate resilience and sustainability, and critical investments, of course, and we shall never forget, in public health, education, and may I add to the list the new currency of today's digital world electricity and broadband. One, therefore, we call on the multilateral development bank shareholders to implement the recommendations of the G20 capital adequacy frameworks and to do so by the end of this year. Two, that the World Bank and the other multilateral development banks must use, must use the remaining headroom, must increase their risk appetite and also look at new guarantees in the holding of special drawing rights to expand lending to governments at least by a trillion dollars and to ensure that the tenor of that lending is appropriate to the needs of the moment as I reflected just now. Three, that there should be new concessional lending that prioritizes the attainment, yes, of the sustainable development goals everywhere and the building of climate resilience everywhere, but especially in climate vulnerable countries. Today's donors generally agree to offer concessional funding when a disaster has struck. And Mark, I said it at the goalkeepers this week, when they do so, it is too late because all you're leaving me to do is to pay the undertaker, not to save lives. We need the money before the disaster because their own efforts show that money spent for every dollar spent before the disaster in resilience building will save seven times the investment in avoided loss and damage, not to mention loss of life. And finally, the task of transformation is too big for governments alone. Moreover, on a global public goods, like the climate, we have to move beyond country by country responses that have become bogged down by issues of who should do more and who shouldn't. We need to ensure that we bring together those companies that are benefiting either egregiously from the provision of global public goods or that their behavior has caused the global public risk in the first place. And Zane, I take your additional point this morning and will ask to add it in our rhetoric and our, 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 our communication, sorry of sovereign wealth funds. Four, we need a global mechanism for raising reconstruction grants for any country that has been imperiled by a climate disaster. This is fundamentally the loss and damage argument, the framework that should be financed, we believe, by the fossil fuel industry and indeed the renewable energy industry that may benefit also from the provision of the solutions. And we feel that this is what is consistent with our own motto in Barbados. As we manage crises, we share the burden, but we share the bounty. Five, we need a new issuance 
of $650 billion of special drawing rights or other low interest long-term instruments to back the multilateral agencies to create a new global balance sheet, if you like, that accelerates private investment in low carbon transition wherever in the world it is most effective so to do. We have one climate. And why do we need that global balance sheet? Because most of our countries are already highly indebted countries. And therefore, even if you give me the money, if I don't have the fiscal space, I look at it and cannot touch it. Six, and I'm finishing soon. We, <laughs> we need a change in the IMF articles so that it can direct future issues of special drawing rights to those who need it most. I understand that this will require US congressional approval because in truth and in fact, the US has the ability to block it because they have 17% of the voting rights. And I'm told what is needed to change the articles of agreement is 85%. So let us get Congress on board, not just to focus on the 300 million people here, but the seven and a half billion people of the world. And seventh, and we call it now on all major issues, issuers of debt, of sovereigns and agencies to the markets that must help normalize and prioritize natural disaster and pandemic clauses. You know, there's nothing like an idea whose time has come. Barbados is the largest issuer of bonds with natural disaster clauses. And last night, a story appeared in the Financial Times indicating that the UNDP was in discussions with Pakistan to urgently and immediately enter discussions for debt relief so that they may be able to focus on the reconstruction of Pakistan. The genius of those debt clauses is that it keeps the lender whole but it gives the borrower the fiscal space to meet the unenviable target of rebuilding. I maintain there is no country in the world, no institution in the world, no company, no individual in the world that will give Barbados the equivalent of 18% of GDP should a hurricane strike. That is what the natural disaster clauses do. And indeed, this week, when we issued blue bonds for the first time, repurchasing 150 million of our own euro bond with the backing of the Inter-American Development Bank and Nature Conservancy to create a marine conservation trust with savings and interest of over $50 million in the next 15 years, we took the opportunity to include, and it was agreed to, a pandemic clause that will do the same thing that the natural disaster clause did. If those pandemic clauses were in, we would not be talking about a DSSA of $12 billion, but we would have unlocked $1 trillion in liquidity for the developing world and for the developed and middle income world. These clauses, as I say, are orderly, they're predictable, and they allow for a temporary debt standstill. And it would provide, as I said, that level of liquidity that is critical that no other instrument will. My friends, as I said, that paper I read in Pakistan, I'd like to, on Pakistan, please go and get it. They don't have those clauses yet, but what the UNDP is asking them to do is the equivalent of what those clauses would prescribe in a very clear way. So if all debt instruments, if all debt instruments, can have those clauses, we would immediately stop a lot of the bleeding and preempt what could otherwise be a serious liquidity crisis in the world. It just requires courage. It doesn't require a sword, but it requires the power of the pen. I've asked my staff today to distribute copies of the Bridgetown Agenda as we seek to build a global movement and coalition so that we can have a certain call and ask to the world to come together as one. You know, in the words of that famous song, We Are the World, that I quoted yesterday, I go back to it. It is our time.
to lend a hand to life, for we are the world, and we are the children, and we are the ones who can truly make that brighter day. And yes, my friends, the challenges that we face in every country across the world are in many ways, yes, more severe than any, any that we have met, certainly in my lifetime. Wars, the pandemic, the climate, the energy crisis, the food security crisis, all wreaking untold havoc on the populations. And when I say it, sometimes I get queasy because we talk about populations, but that word doesn't capture the tragedy to each human being, doesn't. And that crisis is happening, not just in poor countries or middle income countries. It is happening as we are seeing in rich countries where poor people are being left on the margins of even rich countries' development. This is a moral cry. And our existing international fora must seek to navigate and drive global policy making and stop falling short in the moment of greatest need of our planet. The most lessons that we can learn in truth and in fact come from the life and work of Kofi Annan. And I don't say so arbitrarily, but I trust that as a good lawyer and advocate, I have laid the case today for you. And that the words speak clearly today to us, here and now, raise ipsa loquita. The facts speak for themselves. We know what we must do as a global community. From the embers of the COVID and climate crises, from the inadequacies and failings of the existing international system, from the desire of the global family for inclusion, from the need for capital investment, healthcare systems, and technological access, which will put people at the center of development. We are now challenged to look at what we have so far built to consider now and to craft what must now be. And it falls therefore to us to do that which has not yet happened. The social and economic inclusion of the world's people and the protection of the planet on which people live. The responsibility is ours to write by word and deed the new charter for the 21st century. And Kofi Annan made his farewell statement before the General Assembly in September 2006. He had four and a half decades of experience serving this great body, the United Nations, and of course, the international community. From a junior professional officer to the very apex of the organization with a depth, breadth, experience through difficult times like this, Mike. <laughs> Faced with the challenge of forging unity where there was division and creating order where there was chaos. It was with his customary clarity, candor, optimism, and above all else, dignity that he concluded with this statement thus. Yes, I remain convinced that the only answer to this divided world must be a truly united nations. Climate change, HIV AIDS, fair trade, migration, human rights, all these issues and many more bring us back to that point. That was his farewell message to the global community. Addressing each that is dispensable for us, each of us, he continued, in our village, in our neighborhood, and in our country. Yet each has acquired a global dimension that can be reached by global action, agreed and coordinated through this most universal of institutions. That was his farewell message. Yes, my friends, today there is a choice we're making. We are saving our own lives. It's true, we will make a better day. Just you and me and you and you 
and you and you. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister, for that speech of immense power uh, carried on a wave of pure logic. I would now like to invite the President of the International Crisis Group, uh, President Comfort Arrow, to offer some reflections and then followed, of course, by our Chair of the Board, uh, Mr. Kevin Rudd. Um, thank you very much, Said. Um, Prime Minister, I am totally speechless. I have no right to even follow you, but to put my head down, take your paper like a good student, go and study, reflect, come back and ask you questions about how we can do everything that you've just said. It is an honor to be in your presence. On a personal note, my aunt, a Bayesian, <laughs> will, be, will be mightily jealous, <laughs> jealous that, I, that I am in your company today and I'm going to let her know that I am in your company. <laughs> we are here to honor Mr. Anand and I will, he will always be Mr. Anand to me because culturally from Nigeria, I can't call him anything else but Mr. Anand. <laughs> And we're here to, to celebrate him, but in truth, we are here to celebrate you as well. Because what you've just said today, the marching order that you've given us today, it will be a disservice to Mr. Anan if we did not pick up what you said. When the committee was deciding who was going to serve as the first lecturer, we said that we couldn't have business as usual. We said we couldn't have the same usual suspects. We said we needed somebody who fulfilled the vision that Mr. Anand laid out for a future generation, that he, his search was for future leaders. And you really have fulfilled the launch of the inaugural lecture. I don't even know where to start. When Mark said that you are the insurgent, I said, great, because I am going to be your foot soldier and I'm going to accompany you in that work. If we need insurgents to break down, to transform, to change, to do the things that you want to do, Crisis Group will accompany you in that mission. You have 135 who are willing to join you in that. And I'm sure Open Society and IPI will follow you in that transformative agenda that you have set out. I will not say any more because I don't think um, I ought to be making speeches after what you just said. Um, as an organization whose work is about prevention, mitigation and resolution, you have clarified our mandate. You have given meaning and weight to our mandate. And it's our job and responsibility as future leaders to make sure that we are part of that journey that you have just outlined. It is an action plan. Every detail is in there. It is not an ideas plan. It is a, it is a call to act. And if you're looking for the guideline, for the do list, it is in those 17 pages mm -hmm. that you outlined. And I thank you very much. And I look forward to accompanying you and being part of that mission. Thank you very much. And, and finally, it gives me great pleasure to welcome the Honorable Kevin Rudd, Chair of the Board of uh, Directors of IPI, President and CEO of the Asia Society, the 26th Prime Minister of Australia, who will provide concluding remarks. Please. Thank you, Zaid, and thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, I only have 35 minutes of short remarks here, so <laughs> settle back, get some popcorn, and there's, and there's some booze up the back. We're Australian, that's how we do things. <laughs> this has been a good day, and the reason it's a good day is that if you're engaged in the life of this institution, most of us spend it in trench warfare, uh, clause by clause, uh, element by element, bit by bit, occasionally a bit of progress, often much regress. But today we could lift our, our sight above the trench line and see the world as it could and should be, which brings us to the moral purpose of Kofi Annan. And we need to be inspired by such days. Otherwise, it's a relentless and often pointless grind. There are two types of political leader, I think, in the world. Um, those who look after themselves and those who have a wider vision. Those who look after a narrow concept of the national interest and those who understand that the global interest is the national interest. Prime Minister, you're one of the latter. Kofi Annan 
was of similar mind and heart. Kofi stood out in the world because he became the voice and conscience of the world. Uh, Zaid spoke eloquently of Kofi's charisma. When you think of that, and of course Zaid was right, his charisma came of the fact that he was spontaneously infectious, spontaneous in his humanity, uh, spontaneous in terms of his humour, spontaneous in terms of his own grace. These things add up to what we might call charisma because none of them are about yourself. All of them are about the other. And that was Kofi Annan. Mark in his reflections today said, it's impossible to speak of Kofi Annan here uh, while our eyes stay dry. That is true. And that's because Kofi Annan in this world is a rare beast, a rare phenomenon, like Mandela. These are rare people because the price of greatness is great suffering. And Kofi spoke to all of those things in what he said, how he lived, and what he did. Let me mention the politically unspeakable. Uh, he uh, suffered enormous political attack in this country because of the stand he took against the unilateral decision by the United States to invade Iraq. Enormously unpopular. He had the guts to do it. If he was Secretary General today, he would have condemned the Russian invasion of Ukraine with equal clarity and vigor. Kofi spoke for the world and the world is governed by the principles and precepts of the UN Charter with fearlessness. Nain, his widow, spoke with warmth and pride of uh, her husband's remarkable achievements. And it is formidable, the ICC, the HRC, the Global Fund, the MDGs, eventually becoming the SDGs, and the rest. Uh, this is enough for a lifetime of achievement, not a couple of terms of Secretary General. These are formidable. And again, to speak the unspeakable, when I reflect on the United Nations, I think of two great Secretaries General, Doug Hammarskjöld and Kofi Annan. Uh, you, Nain, are connected to both. You're a Swede and you married a Ghanaian. Not bad, that's what I say. But both of these had about them a sense of purpose and mission and suffering, personal suffering for the mission, which speaks volume of therefore their legacy in history. Prime Minister Mia Motley spoke of Kofi, a man ahead of his times. You're right, well ahead of his times. Also spoke with eloquence of Kofi as a proud son of Africa. The Prime Minister also spoke with equal eloquence about the legacy of slavery about the legacy of colonialism, about the legacy of climate injustice, about the legacy of the development gap, and the fact that the Bretton Woods institutions we created so long ago have not been reformed sufficiently either in their structure or in their contemporary financial instruments and facilities to deal with the challenges both of development and of humanitarian and natural disaster, for which I commend you. There's almost a willful blindness about the history of colonialism. I, I rock around Europe quite a bit, despite the fact I'm president of the Asia Society. It always stuns me that this is beyond the pan-European consciousness, that you basically occupied the rest of the world and thought nothing of it after 500 years. Thank you. He took the cash. Goodbye. Uh, and, and here's the 21st century. The collective European amnesia about 500 years of colonial ugliness and slavery is at it as it's embedded economic development model, uh, for me is one of life's continuing obscenities. But as you know, Mark, I never mince my words. <laughs> to conclude, uh, Prime Minister, your remarks on Kofi's five principles of leadership, uh, and I thought eloquently delivered at the, uh, the Truman Library, you could think of to no two more unlikely suspects to become global leaders. A guy from Ghana, and a bloke who owned a drapery store in Missouri, and together forged institutions. Quite remarkable. These are great lessons for us all. And of course, what brings us together today 
is our common passion for the institution across the road, the United Nations organization, this vision that we had at the San Francisco conference in 45 and have sought to nourish still. Uh, I've often had a view that no one will ever close the doors of the United Nations and said it is over, but we all run the risk of it dying the death of a thousand cuts. And that is why we are in desperate need of leadership from us all. And so, Prime Minister, we welcome your leadership for the future. We welcome your voice for the future. We welcome your action for the future, because this is an institution about which we all care. And its future is intimately part of the bank's future and the fund's future. They were created by similar people at the same time for common purpose. Prime Minister Motley, thank you for delivering the 2022 Kofi Annan Lecture. We on behalf of the International Peace Institute are delighted to have you as our guest. And uh, we look forward to supporting you as our friend from the International Crisis Group has already committed us to become, uh, without reference to me. Uh, but I'm flexible, I'm Australian. And we'll join the cause. Uh, count us as your foot soldiers too. Thank you for coming. Thank you.